In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So it was maybe June of 2003, and I was at a church called uh, St. James, Pee Wee Valley, and it was my first Sunday. And I remember spending a good bit of time playing with the, the, the vinyl collar I've got to wear, uh, and thinking it was uncomfortable, and not just because of the cold feeling of vinyl against your neck, uh, but because I didn't feel worthy of it. I didn't feel like... Uh, I knew what it was to be a priest, and I was pretty sure as soon as I walked through those red doors, everyone else would see very clearly uh, that this was a scared 27-year-old still trying to figure out how to be uh, the person God made me to be, much less the priest God had ordained me to be. Uh, and so I remember in procession uh, that uh, this woman, uh, Mary Ann Graves, who was sitting in the front row, uh, much older woman, uh, and she genuflected to me uh, as if I was set apart. And I remember thinking to myself, she surely has no clue who I am. <laughs> and then after church, uh, as I go to meet her for the first time, uh, I talk to her and she says, Father, with this deference and this genuflection that just sort of belied any sense of logic, I'm a 27-year-old who's just trying to figure this whole thing out. You've been in these pews uh, several times longer than I've been alive. Uh, I don't get it. And then I find out that she'd been a widow longer than I had been alive, for several years longer than I'd been alive. Uh, and I thought about what she had uh, learned and, and, and the wisdom that she'd acquired and how in God's green earth could she genuflect to me and call me father with this sense of reverence in her voice. And I realized it had nothing to do with Ben Ma. I hope it had nothing to do with Ben Ma. It was a deference to the role, to the commitment of a priest to care for his flock or her flock. It was a deference to somebody handing their life over to God in the hopes that God might be able to use them in a meaningful way to help keep a community growing in the love of God help the body be able to understand Christ as the head. But every time I put on the collar, at least part of me thinks of that, of Mary Ann Graves and what this collar meant to her and what the role is. Not that I have been per perfect in it, not that I have uh, fulfilled every one of her expectations around that, uh, but that there is more to this collar and more to this role uh, than Ben Moss uh, and that, that it is an awesome responsibility that we take on. And I thought about that today as we baptized at the 8 o'clock service. What an awesome responsibility. And the, the poor little uh, uh, three-month-old baby didn't actually get to make any of the promises. Everybody else uh, made very, very lofty promises on that child's behalf. Uh, and it's not about her living perfectly into those promises, uh, but about her always realizing her identity. Uh, just as I do when I put on this collar, just as I do uh, every time uh, we celebrate a baptism and we claim uh, all of the truths wrapped inside that baptismal covenant, that we are indeed God's sons and daughters, God's children, and we're called to take care of one another and to live out of those uh, truths, to uh, seek and serve Christ and all people, to love our neighbor as ourselves, uh, to seek justice and peace to respect the dignity of every human being. And it was so wonderful to have that opportunity at 8 o'clock uh, to have them claim those truths that are so core to their identity, not necessarily in their ability uh, to achieve them at every turn, uh, but in the fact that that is who they are. And one of the things I love is that all three readings that we have today, our lectionary binds these together, and we get uh, the fluidity of God's story and God's desire for us. And it's all wrapped around some of those very same truths. In the first lesson, we have God talking to Moses about God's deepest desire for God's people. And it's centered around the same thing we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. How do we love our neighbor as ourselves? What does it look like? How do we take care of one another? How are we more careful with one another? And you realize that the law is incredibly relational. So you have God talking to Moses, and he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And we start to wonder, who is he talking about? Who is our neighbor? That's always been our question. We want to know, who do we need to be nice to? Who do we need to be careful around? And he starts with the poor and the alien. 
And he says, make sure that you always leave a little bit of your land uh, 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 untilled uh, or, or unharvested for those that need it so they can, with pride and dignity, uh, be able to come and take care of their family and feed themselves. Uh, and, uh, and we start to think that that's our neighbor. Those who are disenfranchised, those uh, who are hungry, uh, those who are in an alien land, those are our neighbor. All right, we can take good care of them. We can uh, have a particular place in our heart for them. And then he turns us in another direction and says, those who are most vulnerable, the deaf and the blind, those are your neighbor. Those who need, uh, uh, need your, your dignity and who need your care, those are your neighbors. So we got this. The poor, the alien, the vulnerable, then he twists us again. He says, turn around. If you have a special place in your heart for the poor, if you have a passion for caring for the poor, then don't forget that your neighbor is also the rich. They've got complicated lives. They've got needs. They've got hearts that are breaking, and they've got joys they need to share. They're walking the journey with you. That is your neighbor. That's what I love about it is that every turn, whenever we think we've labeled who our neighbor is, God spins us 180 degrees and says, Go from that, that same loving God that tries to bind us in relationship uh, in our journey together uh, with the person that stretches us the most. And then we have Paul. Sometimes we feel like Paul gets it, and sometimes Paul leaves us scratching our head. Uh, but today uh, there's a beauty in the way that Paul refers to each one of us uh, and how we take care of one another. Basically, he calls us to seek God in one another. In fact, what he says is so provocative that uh, we might not be able to fully grasp it in our current uh, day and age. He said, you are God's temple, which sounds nice. But imagine back then, people traveled days journey to get to the temple. People washed themselves every which way in, in several different uh, ritual baths to be able to be ready to walk into the temple because God resided there in a way uh, that you couldn't find God anywhere else. Uh, and you had to change out your money to make sure that you're not defiling yourself by taking Roman money into the temple. You had to uh, make sure you had an ample sacrifice uh, so that the God would be honored uh, as you walked in the temple. You did all of this preparation to go into the Holy of Holies, uh, to go into God's house. Paul said, you, you are God's temple. The spirit of God resides in you. And not just you, but the person next to you. The person that stretches you, the person that you struggle to see as a neighbor is as holy as all of the preparations that you would go into to enter into God's temple. That God is as concretely in that person uh, that you have a tough time seeing as your neighbor. As God is in the temple that you've turned over uh, yourself in order to prepare yourself to go into. It's pretty provocative. It's pretty stretching. Then we have the gospel. We're picking up where we were last week uh, with all of those, uh, those stretchy antithesis statements uh, of Jesus where he starts with the first real defining uh, a law around mercy. Now back uh, in ancient tribal days, uh, there was... Uh, uh, the idea that if somebody killed or, or, or hurt somebody in your tribe, uh, you could go run roughshod over their tribe, uh, and your vengeance was unbounded. Uh, and the first real law of mercy was, it's got to be an eye for an eye. If they kill one of yours, you can kill one of theirs. That was the first, first introduction to mercy. Uh, and from there, Jesus says, it's, that's, that's a starting point. But what I tell you. No matter how much they attack you, no matter how much they sue you, uh, turn the other cheek. Give another coat. Empty every pocket that you have for the care of others. Because God resides in them. Because they are your brother and sister. They're holy. No matter how much they've wronged you, they are of God. He stretches us more and he says, I know that you've heard that you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and of course, we always go to try to figure out what that means. Who is our neighbor? Uh, and Jesus says, well, put that aside and actually think about it this way. Love your enemy. Love your enemy, your mortal enemy as yourself. Bishop Curry, in his consecration sermon, as I mentioned before, uh, encourages us whenever we hear the story of the Good Samaritan, which is, of course, Jesus' response to who is my neighbor, that we put as that person helping us up as we're dying in the ditch, the person that stretches us the most, the very most. Who is at the 
hardest for us to understand as a vessel of God, as a temple of God. And that's the person that's helping us out of the ditch. So I invite you, as you look at the strings between all of these uh, passages, uh, going back thousands of years uh, to the present day, that the question still remains as we walk this journey of faith together. Who is our neighbor? stretches us the most to understand that way? And how do we love them? How do we see them as a vessel of God? Our identity is cloaked in that truth. Our identity as Christians is not that we'll always get it right, not that we'll always be perfect, but that we'll always strive to honor that truth that God calls us to see the holiness, the godliness in every person we meet and to act on.